Okay, so I am teaching today about my model, and you see the posters I'll bring up as relevant on relationships, why we get into relationships. This is actually my new book that's going to be called The Truth is in the Triangle. It is a piggyback off of my first book with the seven gates and the triad, and I'll kind of, since you're new, I'll kind of reiterate sort of like a synopsis of that. Um, but once we kind of address subconscious and childhood traumas and wounds, we move into a relationship as we get older to help satisfy and try to heal those traumas and those wounds. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> so I, what I want to cover today is the whole model in its entirety. Um, this will help you if you want to get into marriage and family counseling. I told you the other day, bring in your mind, and, and you can write notes, about a relationship either that you're in or that you've previously been in, because every relationship will have conflict. And I'm going to explain the origins of why we are trying to satisfy innocent needs um, through a relationship as well as conflict um, through a relationship and why people get together. So that's sort of like the overview. So I'm going to start with the mythology. Where's my marker? I'm going to start with the mythology of relationships and conflict okay so you guys know that i like to always go into some sort of story and i always say there's no new stories and so when i personally and this is just sort of my own therapeutic style when i can understand whether it's a client case or a couple or in my own life a sort of story or a mythology aligned with what's happening since there's no new story. Find it in a movie, find it in a book, find it from myth. And it helps me to kind of understand. So the myth that I kind of want to share with you today is that of Zeus and Hell. <laughs> okay, so Zeus is the king of Olympus. He's the god of the upper world. Okay, when, when the world was divided, Zeus got the biggest piece, and he's god of Olympus and god of the upper world. He marries Hera. This union is symbolically the way that marriage is supposed to look. It's, it's a little defunct, but it's, it's sort of, you know, if we understand, and, and the model stems from this mythology, and I'm going to explain the, the parts. Zeus is a whore. And he cheats on Hera with men, women, and animals. He cannot keep it in his pants. There's this meme. I follow a bunch of Greek mythology meme pages. There is this meme that says, Greek mythology, this big is the book. Greek mythology taking out Zeus' sexual escapades. It's this big. Because everything is about Zeus and who he's screwing. So that's going to play a role in what I call the mistress. And every relationship has a mistress. Hence my podcast, Mistress of the Subconscious. So... I'm going to explain the mistress, and then you can identify in your relationship what the mistress is in your relationship. Every relationship has a mistress. Every one of us comes from a triangle, mother, father, child, and I'll give a synopsis for Ashley's benefit of the seven gates that will then piggyback into this triangle, which is the truth is in the triangle, and the triangle that you have, which is the wrong alliance that you have with your parents. And then we'll explain that. So we'll start with, with Zeus. So Zeus is pretty much a whore. And Hera is the quintessential nagging wife. She is the one that's constantly checking his phone, checking his email, finding out where he's going, who he's with, how he's betraying her. And it's this bigger sort of conflict <coughs> marriage that they have. And all couples are not the same, but there's similar elements in relationship. There's a bickering or a nagging and, and the quintessential nagging wife or the man that brings home the dough or the man sleeps with the housekeeper. The, the themes that we see in, in cinema and, and books and things like that. So it comes from this mythology of Zeus and Hera. Now, Zeus and Hera have two children, and this is really important. Okay? From marriage, two things are born. This is why we get into relationship. Okay? First of all, you have Hephaestus. 
And the second child is Aries. Hephaestus is the only god in Olympus that is thrown out of Olympus and is deformed. When Hera looks at Hephaestus, she's sickened to her stomach and she throws him to the bottom of the ocean and she says, basically, you're not my kid, you're gross, you're deformed, and throws him to the bottom of the ocean so that the nymphs can, um, can raise him. Okay, and we'll get back to that in a second. The second child we have is Ares. Ares is the god of war. Hephaestus, let me specify, is the god of the forge or god of fire. He's also known as Vulcan. So for those of you who are into, like, um, you know, that kind of stuff. So, um, and he's going to represent our innocence and our wound in the relationship healing process in a minute. Ares is the favorite son of Zeus and Hera, specifically Hera, but Zeus too. And he is the warrior. We talked about him a few weeks ago. He is the archetype of war and the brute war, not the Athena. Zeus births Athena by himself out of his own head. Different mythology. This is through marriage is Ares, which is the war. This is conflict. It is impossible to have a union. And again, I'm speaking specifically about romantic relationship, love and marriage, but this could be extrapolated out to any two relationships or even grander scale at an organizational level. Okay, when you're dealing with more than one person, you're going to have this conflict. You're going to have conflict originate from one person and themselves anyway, and I'll, I'll briefly touch on that, but that was what the seven gates was more about. This is now bringing that conflict into Okay, so you cannot, impossible, have a relationship with two people and not have conflict. It is the story. Two people get together, call them Zeus and Hera for the sake of this story. They birth Hephaestus, <laughs> something ugly, something that needs to be discarded and fixed, okay, and war or conflict. That's why people get together. And I had somebody ask me the other day, why do people get together? Why do people even assume a relationship? And it is because this is the format in which we're trying to heal what was discarded in childhood. Okay? So let's talk a little bit about Hephaestus. I am going to use Hephaestus here. And if you look at my archetype poster, this symbol is Neptune. Okay? Now, I'm going to just use some, some freedom here and use the symbol of Neptune. Not that Neptune and Hephaestus are two different gods, but energetically they're very similar, and it's going to tie into the mistress piece of this in a moment. And you see the Mars um, archetype. What do I have next to Mars? Creator. Okay, so not only conflict, but the positive side, because all archetypes have light and dark, is the creator side, the ability to create something new. And when two people come together, they want to create a business. They want to maybe create a child. So there's a creator energy here, too, that is part of why people come together. It's not only just the conflict, but it's to create from an old, discarded Hephaestus something new. Okay? And then Neptune, I have the word innocent. And that's going to be important as well. <laughs> so this was discarded. And this is, you know, sort of what's outdated or, um, or wrong in ourselves. Okay? So this is sort of the format. And in itself, it makes a triangle, right? Zeus and Hera at the top, Hephaestus and Aries. This is the truth is in the triangle. Why is the truth in the triangle? Okay, so first, before we get into the specifics of a model, I want to talk to you a little bit about relationships. And I have a, a theory that I call threadmate versus soulmate. Okay, so soulmate is a new age term that people believe that there's like one person out there for them. Okay, and that's actually a little bit misunderstood 
soulmate from a new age theory perspective is that there's a whole bunch of people that vibrate at your same energetic level and any one of those can be a soulmate. Think of a ladder, A to Z. If you're vibrating at the letter D, on that floor of letter D, there's a whole bunch of people that can vibrate at your level and all of those are soulmates, okay? But what I have written is, it implies that there is only one person for you and that there is a special out of this world connection. It is rooted in new age and is not reality based. So there's some truth to that. I'm obviously in the new age realm, but I've renamed this to Threadmate. And what I have is a Threadmate is based on reality. Threadmates pair up according to shared values. This is super important because we're going to talk about that in a minute. And we understand there are several partners for each person. However, we choose our partner for the common thread we will fight for in the relationship and the thread you can live with or can't live without. So before I get deeper into the thread mate versus soul mate, I want to talk to you about something that's called the Heros Gamos. <laughs> Heros Gamos is a fancy term that means mystical marriage, okay? I'm not going to get into all the spirituality, but if you're into spirituality and symbology like I am, you might want to study the symbolism of the circle in what we call sacred geometry, okay? So the circle is never ending. Everyone's equal. A lot of spiritual traditions and philosophies like shamanism are based on this. And from the circle, all these other sacred geometrical forms are made, okay? And again, another class, we have a few of those here. The dream catcher, um, I don't, I think downstairs I have the Metatron's cube, but we've talked a little bit about that. In the, I'm just going to focus on the circle. The circle, and I've shared this with you, my favorite symbol that if I ever were to get a tattoo is called the squared circle. And the squared circle or the philosopher's stone, not Harry Potter, but spirituality and alchemy, the circle represents spirit on the outside, which is all of the universe, as well as the inner version of spirit, that's your inner God, which is basically the same as within, so without, that's called the law of correspondence in, in metaphysics, okay? So the circle is sort of like the beginning of all other things that are going to be built upon it. My first model, the seven gates, is about bringing the client or yourself to wholeness, understanding your subconscious wounds, how they were created at the moment of conception, through pregnancy, through your birth process, your zero to seven story, and then gave you the model on how to heal or <coughs> work through subconscious trauma. So my theory of relationship is sort of piggybacking on the fact that you've done some work already on the subconscious of your personal trauma, and now you're assuming a relationship with someone else who's done their work, and now together you're forming this Heros Gamos. But let me give you a little background. And in my book, in my book Witch Bitch, I actually have a Heros Gamos ceremony. The Heros Gamos tradition comes from, from um, antiquity where the woman, the goddess, the woman goddess, would marry her god of choice, okay? Uh, 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 some godhead that she, that she prayed to. And they would actually do, as a pagan ceremony, that they would have a union, mystical marriage. They would lay, and, and that's part of what I write in my witch bitch book, lay next to the picture of the Godhead, if it's Jesus, if it's Brahma, if it's Vishnu, whoever you're attracted to in mythology, and marry this God. And the idea is that it's the Godhead, this universal circle, marrying you as the inner God, and now you have this union. Okay, so this is an ancient technique. I've taken this Heroes Gamos and now expanded it into relationship. So we have here what's called the Vesica Pisces. <coughs> you might know this from English classes, the Venn diagram from elementary school, okay? But this is actually a symbolic spiritual um, symbol called the Vesica Pisces, okay? 
What I have done is I've created, so I've taken this concept of the mystical marriage, the Heroes Gamos. I'll talk to you about this in a minute, but basically it's the marriage to self. So you have now married yourself and you're looking for someone else who's done your sort of vibration or equal level of work. That's why we're connecting on this sort of soulmate vibrational um, context. And from that, I've created something called the I, I, and the we. So again, here's your Vesica Pisces. And this is your partner who's done their work. They're a complete I. You have done your complete work, your I. And now you come together and you create a new relationship, a new circle. The inner circle of the Vesica Pisces is what I call the we. So when I talk to clients, I talk in reference to the I, the I, and the we. And the we, in my opinion, is a whole other entity. It, your relationship is an actual entity. It is a child. It is a creation of sorts. Okay? So I have here relationship the we as a new entity. Each partner brings 50% of their whole self to form the new entity, but doesn't lose themselves in the process. So I oftentimes work with couples about how to not only regain <coughs> the I, and a lot of people haven't done the I work, so to speak, the seven gates work, so we're doing side by side, and that's fine. <coughs> Excuse me. And then to build this we on these good, healthy adult principles so that the relationship can move forward. Now, you cannot have an I, I, and a we if you don't know what your thread is. So think of the relationship that you have in mind and write, what is the shared value? What is the thread that you have with that person? Why did you get together? Did you get together for sex? Did you get together for money? Did you get to, together to build a and Did you get together to piss off your parents? I don't care what the thread is. The point is, every relationship needs to have a thread. This is the thread, the shared values that you and this person came together to grow in this relationship. Every relationship is going to have a different thread. That's why every relationship is a little bit different. Okay, so I had a client the other day, and she's like, how do I build my I, I, and the we? And I said, well, what's your thread? And she's like, oh, the family. She has a family, he has a family, and the we, she wants the thread to be the shared family together. They may or may not have kids together, but they're definitely blended, and that's what the we is. So you have to identify or help your client identify what the thread is, what their thread mates on. And this is important, because if you have a couple that gets together for the thread of building a business, and one of them cheats, in my theory anyway, I don't care, that's not a deal breaker, in my opinion, it may be for your client and that's fine, but in my therapy technique, but if the thread is intact, the business is still intact, and that's functioning and building the we, who cares? And we'll talk about cheating in a minute because that's an important thing which I said I call the mistress. So you have to understand have your client understand this first step. What is the thread? What are you thread mates on? If you don't understand the thread, the shared values upon which you built the matrimony, then you're going to be kind of convoluted and putting energy and fighting about conflict that isn't necessary. So that's about clarity. Again, getting clear with what the focus is of the relationship of the thread. So that's super important. <laughs> One of the things I do in my model, and I'll get to later, is, and I've told you this before, how did the client, how did the couple meet, and what was their first fight? That's going to tell me everything. That goes back to this. So when we get deeper into the model, I'll explain why I do that. And you might want to write those questions down on your notebook so that you have those answers for yourself and you can kind of see what you've built the foundation of this relationship on. Okay? So... The Heros Gamos mystical marriage starts with the goddess marrying the god, the, the, the god without with the god within, and now there's this whole person. I've extrapolated that now to include the couple. Let's just assume for a moment that each couple has done their work 
They're both in their sort of healthiest form, and now they've come together. And so the Heros Gamos is a mystical marriage. And doing this work, spiritual work in a relationship, is what so many spiritual texts write about. Oftentimes, we read about Tantra, you know, where you find a sexual partner and, you know, you work through through sexuality and spirituality. I'm not going to get into that today, but there's a lot of foundation in spiritual texts where spirit and sexuality meet in the second chakra, um, Shiva Shakti, the Lingam and the Yoni, all of these concepts come from this idea. So this is the mystical marriage, but first you must get there first with yourself as an individual, then you find a partner to meet you there and you do the work, okay? So there's some, a little bit of the spiritual background, why I use this symbol, okay? So this is what I call, like I said, the Heros Gamos, the mystical marriage, which is the point of this. So let's go back to the triangle. So I told you all before, I'm sorry that this marker is no good. I told you all before that we all come from a triangle. We all come from a triad. If you think that your relationship is different, you're wrong. Every single person comes from three, comes from a triangle. Therefore, if my original model is correct, that every single person, place, thing, or situation is your mother and or your father, your relationship is going to be no different. You married your mother or your father. Okay? So your relationship also has a third person. And I don't mean person like an actual physical person. It could be an addiction. It could be a car. It could be a workaholic. It could be an, an actual mistress. It could be um, an, an eating disorder. There's a third entity in your marriage relationship and that's the point of this is to understand why that shows up in your life and what it's there to teach you to heal so that you indeed can have a mystical marriage with your partner use each other to grow and heal from even deeper subconscious stuff and create a very strong we okay so just a kind of recap for those of you <coughs> who don't know too much about my first model Mother, father, get together and have a child. You. The state of mind in which your parents were at, at the moment of conception, whatever pajaritos they had in their head, pajaritos were birds, whatever thing they had floundering around their head, they want to be the next president, they're waiting for their next addiction, I don't care what it is, becomes your subconscious mind. And the mind that you are throughout your entire life until you decide to leave home, and I'll talk about that briefly in a second, is your mother and your father's mind and mental state. Okay? That, that's sort of what you're dragging. Okay? So, at first, the moment of conception, the mind is sort of um, determined, or the subconscious mind. Pregnancy gives an added layer how you choose to be loved, and that will definitely come up in your relationship. And there's a great uh, book, The Five Love Languages, and, and he does a nice summary of that. Astro astrology will say 12, based on the 12 signs, but it's similar. Then your birth story, which I've told you is how you change and move into cycles in your life. And then zero to seven is actually your trauma or your story or your hastos, which is super, super important because you are together with your partner to heal part of your Hephaestos, okay? And that's where sex and mistress and addictions and, and workaholic and all that stuff comes into play, okay? So at zero to seven, you figure out there's something wrong with you, you're expelled from your family, you're the class clown, your brother was born and you were no longer the only child, whatever your story was, you got at zero to seven. That's your personal mythology, your personal story and how you're going to live in the world, show up in the world, proving that story right, because that's your story and you're going to own it, okay? And then you get into relationship and hopefully you can break that story down and rewrite a new story on a healthier self and 
hopefully healing and, and helping your partner and then building your relationship anew. Okay? So that's sort of that origin. We all come from a triangle. We all come from a triad. So let me just backtrack a moment about the mystical marriage. In every story, in every mythology, the hero <coughs> must leave home. Okay, Joseph Campbell did what's called a monomyth, and he identified that all of these mythologies, all of these stories showed that we must leave home, heed a call, answer a call, figure something out, and then return home. It's the story of the prodigal son in the Bible. It's Demeter and Persephone in Greek mythology. It's been stated over and over and over again. Okay? Home is not a physical place. Home is within. Home is a metaphorical space within yourself. Okay, so that's important to understand. I had someone earlier this week say, I don't have a home. And what I hear that person tell me is they don't have any inner peace. They're not centered. They don't really have a true identity, a true sense of self with a capital S. Okay? So in part of the mystical marriage and why we marry this God, okay, or goddess, is because we're trying to unify external universe with internal self and make that marriage. Now, actually going out into the world and creating a physical home space with our potential partner. Okay, so this is super, super important. I'm not going to get into the myth of Persephone. We've talked about that, but she gets raped and she goes back home to her mother, Demeter, but she's changed. Anytime you quote unquote leave home, and again, this is not about physically leaving home. I've told my children since they were little, you want to go find yourself and run away to India or Bali, go right ahead. But no one needs to leave their couch. You could do this internal. It's an internal process. Okay? Your home state is inside where you feel at peace, centered, know your third chakra, stuff like that. Okay? Stuff we talked about. But you do change as a result of your return home and now you come home and you're different same people same family same thanksgiving dinner but what's changed your state of mind has changed your own state of self has changed <coughs> and i've said this before chop wood get enlightened chop wood when you get enlightened when you've had this change a shift of perception this rape you've left home and you've come back you are different you've grown up so to speak that's the adult in my first book. You left child, a state of mind. Remember, it's a state of mind. This has nothing to do with going off on a pilgrimage, although feel free to do that if you like. When you come back as the adult, your state of mind is different. You learn to meet your own needs rather than expecting your partner to meet your needs. Okay? So that's all in the first book. And that's kind of a, a synopsis. We have to leave home to come back to ourselves. We chop wood, get enlightened, and we're back to the same house, the same people, the same marriage, the same job. Nothing looks on the outside to have changed because this is an inner process, like the chrysalis when the um, caterpillar grows into the chrysalis and comes out the butterfly. Okay, That metaphor shows that there is a physical difference, but you look exactly the same. What's changed is your inner cocoon, your inner chrysalis, your inner state. That's the mystical marriage. Now we're extrapolating this to the relationship. So every single person comes from a triangle. What happens? This is super important. And you can write this down. And you may figure it out now or it may take you some time. Okay? You have a wrong alliance with one of your parents. The ideal triangle would be your mother and your father, Zeus and Hera, at the base of the triangle, and you, Hephaestus or Aries, and you're both at the tip of the triangle, right? Your parents are the base, the foundation, and you're the product of that. That isn't how it went down, okay? When your parents were in their Zeus and Hera fighting, in their conflict, and deciding how they were going to sort of be a couple in the world, you, with your subconscious mind, because remember, from zero to seven, you're still in development of the subconscious. Even though it started at, at conception, you have until seven. 
And all you're doing is taking an inventory of how your parents interact. This does not mean that mother had to be there, father had to be there. It could have been your grandmother, it could have been your aunt and uncle, you could have been in a foster home. It does not matter because like I said in my first model, every person, place, thing, or situation is a representative of your mother and your father. So don't take this literally, although I'm gonna use the example of mom, dad, and child just because it's easier, okay? But it doesn't mean it's literal. So don't say, oh, my grandmother raised me, therefore that doesn't work. Forget that for a moment, okay? What you did was you stood back and you made an inventory and you all wrote a paper on this called Power Currencies. Great papers, by the way. Everyone really knocked it out of the park. And we negotiate and we interact with people with power currency. Mars or Aries, war and conflict, another word is power, okay? And it's also creator. From power we create, people with the power of the creators. It's, it's metaphorical language, okay? And you looked at your parents and you asked yourself, who has the power here? Mind you, subconscious, you're a little kid, you don't know that. And you made a determination of which parent had the power and again, goes back to your shared values. That's why the thread mate concept is so important. Why you attract the person you attract based on shared values. Which one of your parents had the power in the way, and I'll explain that in a minute, in the way that you could swallow it? Your father might have had the money. Your mother might have been what we call in Cuban la mosquita muerta, the little dead fly on the wall. You as a child decided that overt power with money, you don't really like that. You'd rather be la mosquita muerta. You'd rather be the little sheep, poor me, victim. And you saw your mother as having the power. So you made a wrong alliance with mom. Or you saw your father with the money, calling the shots, deciding where you're going on vacation, and you liked that overt sense of power. And you said, I'm going to follow that. And that's how you became. And then you had a wrong alliance with your father. It might have to do some soul searching for you to figure out which one you are. Again, this is a piggyback on my previous model, which you should have already done that sort of work. But your client may not have, and so you bring them up to this. In my model, I talk about the good buckets and the bad buckets. And we did that activity in class. Write the good of your mother, the good of your father, the bad of your mother, the bad of your father. News flash, your mother and your father are the same person. The same person. I want to think that my father's so much better than my mother. Same person. The difference is one of them was covert and one of them was overt in their power. That is why from the birth of Zeus and Herod's marriage, conflict, Aries, war, Creative energy, power is born. Do not think that you are any different than any other person. Another word for that is ego. And we do get our ego from that. The way we manipulate in the world and, and throw our power around from those power currents comes from that. This is all learned and inherited at the moment of conception when you inherited your parents' mind. So those buckets are there for you to write down the qualities mom and dad has, but they're the same people, the exact same person. One has just chosen to be more outright in terms of their overt power that they want to beat you or, or call the shots or take the money. And the other one is more of a victim or what we say in Spanish, dale la vuelta. Like they're like, oh, how can I manipulate this to get what I want? I used to know a woman who worked at a plastic surgery office and she used to tell women when they would come for their consultation, okay, it's going to be this much money. Have sex with your husband and then ask him for the money. That's a covert power play. Not anything new. Then you've got the woman in the boardroom who unbuttons her blouse and shows her boobs to the boss. 
That's an over power play. Sexuality, again, Mars is using sex, and, and sex is an important part of this in terms of both Hephaestus and Aries, and I'll get to that, okay? So which one are you? Are you the covert power play or the overt power play? Who was the covert and the overt in your parents' buckets? The bottom line is I don't care. It's the same thing. But sometimes for the client, <laughs> and it helped me, I was doing my model for my life to understand that, okay? The person that you chose had the better bucket. So I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and she's like, oh, yeah, my mother – you know, as a good person, she's selfless. And I personally don't believe in the word selfless. I've got two theories. You're either self or you're selfish. Self is when you're giving to yourself, meeting your needs, and meeting the other person's needs. Selfish is when you're taking away from yourself and taking away from the other person. Selfless in my book doesn't exist. I, I, if someone has reached that, like Buddha and Jesus, it's so far beyond our notion that I don't even think that that exists. But she says to me, oh, my mother was selfless. I said, that's an interesting choice of words. She's like, well, the other alternative was my father, who was a selfish bastard. Selfless and selfish are the same. One is overt, one is covert. So you could strip it down and really get down and dirty with your parents and your buckets, or you can just take my word for it. That's the way it is. When two people get together and you think you're so different than your partner, you are not. You're getting together on a shared value, on a thread to work through something. That's why I'm not saying every relationship has to last forever, but it can because I have a theory that we renegotiate every seven years and you can renegotiate those threads. Okay, when I ask a client, <coughs> what, how did you meet and what was your first fight? Tells me, how did they meet the innocence, the shared value, the thread, and what was your fight, first fight? Tells me how the egg got cracked. The crack in the egg. Every single one of us has a crack in the system. Okay. And if we figure that out, we have the whole story of the couple in front of us. We can help them reach a point of renegotiation, crack the foundation of how they met, rebuild on a new shared value, a new thread make, and keep going. That's the beauty of long-term relationships, that you get to do this over and over and over again. In this day and age, most people are not doing the work together. They're, they're just checking out. They decide to leave. So we're getting different you know, sort of views of, of this. But that would be the long-term marriage use, usefulness of a model like this would be to see that play out. That would be amazing research. But whatever. So you decide, <laughs> as a little kid, dad has the power because he has the money. I don't know. He's the one who beats my mother. He's the one who gets to go drinking and come home late. He gets to, to, to watch sports on TV. doesn't matter. Mom the power because she gets to shop and do whatever she wants and pretends that that you know that she's not getting anything and she's a victim and dad's calling the shots like in that big big fat greek wedding when the woman says to the daughter your father's the head but i'm the neck are you the head or are you the neck that's another way to to, to say over or covert which one are you? Which one do you like to be? Which one in your relationship of your parents did you observe that you thought had more power? There's no wrong or right answer. It's just so you know who you have the alliance with. Whoever you have the alliance with is at the tip, is at the bottom of the triangle. So my alliance is with my father. That means that my mother is at the tip. Okay? And this is going to come into play a few times. So write that on your paper. And you can always change it, but just so you could go through the model, who do you have the alliance with? Is it your mother or your father? My dad had more overt sort of power. I obviously like that, and I chose to follow in his footsteps and, and live in my relationships that way that haven't served me much, but I identified it. Okay? So you first have to identify who is the wrong alliance with. 
Then at the tip of the triangle is the other parent. The importance of this, and it goes back to the first book, when you know that you have, in my case, the mother at the tip of the triangle, and we'll get to that as the, as the mistress in a minute, that is the parent's qualities from their bad bucket that you need to integrate into your whole life, into your life to become whole. So I'm in that process right now, and I've told you about my Band-Aid. A, awareness, I, integration, D, do it differently. That's the Band-Aid approach in order to get whole, to heal the wound, or as much healing is done, the scarifying the wound. Okay? So I now have gone back to the buckets and looked at all the stuff that I put in my mother's bad buckets, and I am picking it apart and saying, oh, I need this. Oh, I need to do this. Oh, this is a good thing. So you come with a different perception about what's good and bad. Because good and bad is relative. There's no real good and bad. I always say there's universal truths and then there's value statements. Very few universal truths. Very few. Everything else is just a value statement. And I told you a few weeks ago that you have to pick a stance. You have to pick a side. Okay, we are required. Even if it's quote unquote wrong, you have to stand for something. You have to pick something. You can change it later on. But you've got to know what you stand for. And part of the integration process of healing the subconscious is understanding that you might have chosen the wrong alliance. And now you're saying, wait a minute, maybe my mother in my case does have something to offer me. And I'm going to integrate that bucket. And that's the process I'm in now. So I had to go through a whole five year stint with cancer, figure all this stuff out to now say, hmm, maybe I shouldn't have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Maybe my mother's bucket does have some wisdom. And I can tell you that both your parents, if you believe you chose them, great. If you believe that that's just who you got, great. Have something to teach you. Have some wisdom to impart on you, even if you're adopted, even if they mistreated you. There is wisdom in those buckets because if your mind is them, you better understand your mind. And the only way you're going to understand that is by populating those buckets and identifying that you are them. And rather than shunning the shadow and hating yourself for being them, the parts that you don't like of them, you need to integrate those so that you could become a whole person, which goes back to the original Peros Gamos mystical marriage. You've got to achieve self. You've got to achieve a, a place of home within. And that only comes from unifying those buckets that mom and dad gave you. So you go back. You realize that your mother's on the tip of the triangle. And what did your mother show you in the bad buckets that you've discarded as part of your shadow, as part of the part of you that's discarded that you don't like about yourself, Bring it in, integrate it into your life, and now you can work from a place of wholeness. And hopefully the do it different, the D part of the Band-Aid, is what you do in your relationship. And hopefully you don't repeat a Zeus and Hera, which most people do, but you do it differently, and you find a healthy way to live in relationships. That usually isn't the case. It's usually through the relationship, if you stick it out long enough, that you'll get to this point. Does everyone understand the wrong alliance and how important it is for your subconscious, for your growth, for your sense of self, your identity, and what you're bringing to the relationship? You are bringing this triangle into the relationship. Yes. So you have to identify that first. Okay? Now let me take you back to why Hephaestus and Aries are so important. And you have Hephaestus, an innocence, and Aries, a war and a conflict, going on within you. So there's a little Native American story I love to share, and I, I, I talk about this with my daughter all the time, and I'm sure I've told you this before, where a grandfather is talking to his grandson, and he says, son... There's two wolves living inside of you, a dark wolf and a light wolf. And the grandson says to his grandfather, and which one wins? 
And the grandfather says, it depends which one you feed. Okay? Most people want to feed their light wolf. We cannot negate the dark wolf, the shadow, the bad buckets, like I call this. This is, this is a, a quick story to explain that we all have a dark side. We all have a shadow. We discard the sad shadow. The reality is we have to feed both of them. We really do. And that's why Hephaestus and Aries come into play. Hephaestus was discarded. He was deformed. He was thrown out of Olympus. During your zero to seven, and I say zero to seven because that's when your personality is developing, those seven years where you're kind of taking on the story, something about you was told was wrong. Okay? <laughs> Every single one of us has this. You had a brother that was born, dethroned you. Your father died and you had to assume to be father of the house and you can't do it as well as your father because you're a six-year-old kid. Your mother told you that girls shouldn't shave their legs, but you shaved your legs behind her back and you were rep reprimanded. You have some story that got you kicked out of Olympus. Olympus is the heaven that you see as your mom and dad. Again, metaphorically, mom and dad. I'm not talking literally. If you happen to be lucky, have mom and dad in the home, great. If not, don't get stuck on that, okay? So from this Olympus, part of you, a part of you was discarded, was kicked out. Girls should be <coughs> innocent and calm and quiet. Children should be heard, uh, seen, not heard. You get more flies with honey, whatever bullshit your parents told you that you should be, that you are not, it's basically discarded you. And you at that moment decided that you were imperfect. You at that moment decided you were not enough. You at that moment decided you were the black sheep of the family. Newsflash, even those of you that are not the black sheep, obvious, even you that are like the pre preferred child, have something that was wrong. You're the preferred child because you never acted on that. So you lived up to the expectation of mom and dad, the best student, even though you wanted to throw your school books in the river. That, if you flip that around, that perfect, that you know preferred child, because Aries was the preferred child, but we're talking about Hephaestus, and you turn it around, that was what your real wish was. You just didn't act on it. Some of us acted on it as the black sheep. Others of those didn't and <coughs> stayed in, in the glory. But your thought was, ooh, I want to do that bad thing. You didn't do it so you wouldn't be kicked out of Olympus. But your thought around it already kicked you out, showed you you were imperfect. Every single person has this. Okay, this is why I say the cracking of the egg. The relationship will explain to you what the relationship doesn't have that's perfect. The first fight will tell you everything about that soft spot, that weak spot. I normally ask clients, what happened between zero to seven? In the astrology chart, you could see it with Saturn. It's very easy. But you yourself might know what happened at zero to seven. What was it about you that was wrong? In my story, I was a girl and not a boy. My mother wanted the boy. She had already had the boy. And my mother didn't want any more children. Asked the doctor to tie her tubes. He said no. I slipped in. And lo and behold, someone was born she didn't want. Remember, this is my story. I mean, it's true. But your story is true because this is how you're living your life. And I was a, boy, a girl, not a boy. So what do you think I did to solve that problem? I don't want to be seen. I, I'm very loud and I obviously overcompensate it with my voice and, 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 and you know, whatever I do. But I, I, I don't wear makeup. I don't wear flashy clothes. I'm very demure in that sort of thing. And I took on the role of, in my case, dad, the man. Because if she wanted a boy, and a non-existent child, long old, I was going to give it to her. So when you can identify how you were kicked out of Olympus, your hostos, you're going to understand why you're with your chosen partner. Because that partner is also with that same story. It could be the whole flip side. I'm married, 
the God, the guy on the pedestal, his parents to this day kiss his ass. I married the opposite side of the coin. I'm thrown out of Olympus. He is God. He is Zeus. So don't get caught up on, oh, she's crazy. I'm, I'm with someone who's the opposite story. The opposite is the same. Take out a coin from your purse. There's a heads and a tails, but there's only one coin. When you do it differently, then we're in a whole other paradigm, a whole other story. If not, you're still living out your parent's story, which then becomes yours. And the point of enlightenment, the point of spiritual growth, the point of the mystical marriage to then do it differently is so that we don't continue transgenerational trauma and patterns, the sins of the father, as the Bible says. That's the goal. Is this clear so far? Okay, so something you have to understand, and I'm going to talk about the mistress in a minute. You were kicked out of Olympus in your own head. Maybe you were literally kicked out of your house. Maybe your parents died. Maybe they gave you up for adoption. Maybe your story is very literal, but this is figurative, metaphorical. You were kicked out of Olympus in your own head for having a flaw, or for those of you who weren't the black sheep and stayed on Olympus, you didn't act on the flaw that you want to act on, but you were in your own head, ruined already, damaged, like a face dose, and you extricate yourself. At this point, moment, you realize you need to leave home, you don't fit into this family, you're the black sheep, whatever your story is. This is going to be satisfied, and this is super important, in your sex life. Okay, sex, fantasy, addiction, whether it's workaholic, whether it's gambling, whether it's drugs, I don't care how you get fantasy in your life. Part of the relationship that you have with your partner, I'm going to call it sex for a minute, is to reclaim innocence. Innocence is another word for fantasy. So I had a client the other day, and I said, what's going on? My husband's addicted to pornography. And we, I think we talked about this the other day at lunch. And he loves video games. So when I open up the energy, I see that that's his fantasy. And her fantasy and I see this, she puts her baby down to bed, she stays with the baby. If my theory from the first book is right, our children meet our needs. So her baby meets the need of her to keep occupied and be needed and there's a little fancy in being a mom and the baby and all that. And she thinks about her ex-boyfriend. So she satisfies fantasy by thinking about her ex-boyfriend. Okay, so he has porn, and he has video games. She's got her daughter, and she's got her ex. They are both satisfying the innocence, healing that they were kicked out of Olympus. We must go back into the snow globe. First book, first chapter of my book is Shattering the Snow Globe of Delusion. We are all deluded that our family unit was healthy and happy. Those that come to me that speak about how idyllic and happy their childhood are, are even more screwed up than those of us that realize that our childhood was not idyllic because we've already found the fissure. You as a therapist might have to help your client find that crack, crack it open, and then you help them put that snow globe back together. I've talked about that. But this is what I refer to as the snow globe. Every snow globe has a crack. Every child's innocence is lost. This is considered the rape of Persephone that I have here in the mystical marriage poster. Okay? Your rape. It's a very harsh word, but whatever that was for you, that you were thrown out of Olympus, you must reclaim your innocence. There are actual practices where women go and put the hymen back. They tighten their vaginas. This exists in the real world. This is another way of capturing your innocence. Innocence, and if you remember when we did addiction psychology a few months ago, I 
told you that we've now identified in, addic in addiction research that the parts of the brain related to addiction, it, whether it's food, whether it's drugs, whether it's sexuality, whether it's video games, all of that is the same part of the brain. And we now have science to back up what we've known metaphorically and spiritually all these years. Innocence, regaining that. In my second marriage, we regained our innocence by being addicted, more innocent than this, you can't make this shit up, Hallmark movies. We were addicted to Hallmark movies. That's what we would do. We would watch Hallmark movies all weekend. I mean, that's so Piscean, and I'm a Pisces. Every single one of us wants to re-enter the snow globe. Astrologically, if you know where your Neptune is, that's what you're trying to, to regain, is that innocence. So all addictions, any form of fantasy, whether it's Dungeons and Dragons or drinking or sex or bondage, shoe obsessions, is you trying to reclaim your innocence, okay? That is going to be the mistress in your relationship. And I go back to tell you that every relationship as a mistress, because every single person is born of three. Every single one of us comes from a. Therefore, we must be triangulated in our relationship. So write down what you think your mistress might be. My mistress right now is the alarm clock. My boyfriend has to get up at the freaking crack of dawn. I've named her Hera. And we laugh. I'm like, oh, there's Hera, the alarm clock, because he's got to get to work. That's going to be useful for us in a minute. Your mistress is going to tell you something about your subconscious that you need to heal, repair, integrate, whatever word you want to use. Every relationship has a mistress. It may show up as someone in fidelity, as a real male or female that shows up in your, in your relationship. It may show up as a third person in your bedroom if you're into that. It may show up like this couple as porn or the child or the ex-boyfriend fantasy thoughts. I don't care. I am not the type of therapist that is thrown off by those things. Someone reaches out and says, my husband cheated. So what? Let's work it through. We have a model. There's a reason that we've created. If you believe in that theory, work with me for a moment. Let's just assume we create everything that you created that mistress in your life, being another woman, being an addiction for some reason. Part of that reason is to regain your innocence. But the subconscious does not know how. How do you get back into Olympus? How do you gain the favor of your mother who threw you out because you have a club foot and you're ugly? And she opted for the favorite son, who was brawny and gorgeous. In mythology, there's a wonderful story. So perfect. Aphrodite, goddess of love and beauty. You've all seen her with her long hair in the conch shell. She's sexy. She's gorgeous. Goddess of love. Okay? Hold that for a moment. Do you know that Aphrodite is married to Hephaestus, but is in love with Ares? In our relationship, we have to find, and if you're into three people in your bedroom, this is not a criticism, go right ahead. I'm just talking about the norm, so to speak, okay? And even in there, there's conflict when people are in, in threesomes and things like that, so you still have to figure this out. The work still is the work. Doesn't matter how many people you share in the bed. Love could only be in the union of Hephaestus plus Aries. The exact triangle of the marriage of Olympus of Zeus and Hera. They birthed these two children, and it's only by unification of Hephaestus and Aries that love can actually exist in your relationship. Hence the two questions. How'd you meet fantasy? Everybody. I love a love story. How'd you meet? Tell me how you met. Oh my God. How'd she propose? We all love that shit. 
That's Hephaestus. That's the, the, it's the symbol of Neptune. And I told you I was going to use these interchangeably, even though they're two different gods, but just stay with the metaphor. And this is your first fight. That tells me everything I need to know. If I can help a client integrate those two aspects, healthy. Because they exist in you. <laughs> That's how you rectify your own subconscious. Realizing where you were thrown out of Olympus, where you were thrown out of your family, where you were discarded. I literally was sort of my mother gave me over to another woman, just like a Bezos. So I always say I'm living out that myth. And, <laughs> and Aries represents the ego. What need was left unfulfilled? Where do you need to be validated? What does your partner need to bring to the relationship? Money? Conflict? Some people love to fight, and then they have great makeup sex. That's a thing. They go get restraining orders on one another, and then they, the next day they're in Disney World. This is a thing. I used to work at the courts. So this is reality of how this plays out. So if you learn to unify these two aspects in yourself, and then in your relationship, you can actually have a loving relationship. So Aphrodite was married to Hephaestus because Hephaestus, like I said, was thrown to the bottom of the ocean and the nymphs raised him. And they taught him how to make all this jewelry. So he was like a magnificent forger of, of fire and, and metal. And he, he shows up at Olympus because he's pissed because he's kicked out of, of, of the heaven, as all of us are. And I gave you a lecture a few weeks ago about how really the grief model starts and how all of this starts because we were, quote, unquote, kicked out of heaven. No matter what religion you believe, there was some break from that universal consciousness into this form. Okay. And he shows up at Olympus when Hera's having a party. And Hera sees him and he see, she sees the beautiful necklace that the nymph that raised him is wearing. And Hera, interested as she is, says, son, my dear son, I love you so much. We can all see through that, right? All kids can see through the bullshit of their parents as we get older. And, or we should, right? That's why most of us end up in therapy. <laughs> when, we, when we finally figure it out that all of it wasn't for us, it was more about them. Um, myself included, and I tell you, I will pay for it for the rest of my life. <laughs> and, and what does Hera say to Hephaestus? She says, oh my God, if you make me one of those jewels, I'll give you anything you want. And what do you think Hephaestus asks for? Not to be able to come back, but to marry Aphrodite, who Hera had assigned as Ares' wife. That party, that, I forgot to tell you that part. <laughs> that party that they he went and, and crashed was the engagement party for Ares and Aphrodite. And he showed up, and he made a stink, and all of us do that. This is called passive-aggressive. When we go through those conflict styles, that accommodation, or like I said before, the moquita muerta, or trying to go at the backside instead of asking for what we want. As children, we all learned to ask for what we needed, not get our needs met, but in a roundabout way. So you'd cry, or you'd stay quiet, or you'd give your mother anything she wanted in hopes of you getting your needs met. That's what that is. So Hephaestus didn't show up and say, Mom, I'm mad at you, you hurt me, you discarded me, you threw me to the ocean. No, passive aggressive motherfucker said, I'm gonna make this gorgeous necklace and I know my mother's una interesada and I'm gonna show it off. And she said, you can have anything you want. And he says, I want Aphrodite. Because what we all want is love. That's really what we all want. These love languages, whether they're the moon signs or whether they're that book of the love languages, really all we want is love. And I've shared with you before that we have four unmet needs. 
But all of us lack love. We have them all. But love is truly the unmet need because your parents couldn't love you unconditionally. Therefore, you were left fending for yourself on how to manipulate the situation. And we're all manipulators. Hence, Hephaestus. To try to get love. So yes, it's Aphrodite as a woman, but use it as a symbol, the symbol of love. And he used a, pa a passive aggressive or a codependent or a neediness, all these things that we all say are unhealthy in therapy in relationships to access love because all of us want to go back to Olympus. All of us want to gain the favor of mother and father. All of us want to be allowed in, even though we're not perfect, with our defects, with our bad buckets, with our shadow, with our club foot. All of us. And the part of your relationship where you're trying to get your needs met is using most people unhealthily a Hephaestos-style approach. Not a direct conflict, uh, airy, straight to the point, power currency, language, let's talk about it approach. We'll get to the problem with Aries in a minute. But I really want you to understand. So codependence, addictions. It seems ironic that an addiction would be a way that you would get your need met. Well, if you and your partner are two sides of the same coin, it makes perfect sense. Because if you've ever heard of Alcoholics Anonymous, you've heard of Al-Anon. We talked about this in Addiction Psych. And in my personal opinion, the person who goes to Al-Anon is sicker than the actual alcoholic. Because the alcoholic is the Aries. I'm up front, I'm an addict. You're a codependent. You're sicker than me because you're taking care of me, trying to get your needs met. That's the dysfunction of the relationships from the Hephaestos aspect. Is this making sense? And it's the reason you create your mistress. You create your mistress, again, just to that for a minute. That other woman, that addiction, the gambling, the alarm clock, the shoe obsession, the child, because your child can absolutely be your mistress, like in that client case that I shared. Because you're trying to get your needs met through that mistress. So what I do with a couple is I put the mistress at the top of the triangle and I ask the couple, what are you getting from that mistress? That mistress is a load of information. And I did have a couple a few years back who they actually did have a real mistress. He cheated, repented and went through, they worked through the model, they're still together. It was a great success story. And he was like talking about the, the nurturance and like that maternal feeling. And his wife didn't give him that. She was like a, a professional bodybuilder. She was always at the gym. She was always on circuit training. So he didn't get that maternity part, that, that mushy emotional need. Most men cheat. They're cheating. They're having physical sex. This guy needed an emotional support. That's what it was getting. And then I asked her, and I don't remember now what she was getting but I think it was like to refocus back the marriage and so whatever couple answers what is the mistress giving you is what that person needs to give themselves and that goes back to the mystical marriage it's what's missing in that union of self is this clear so that mistress that alarm clock in my case I have to ask, what is that alarm clock giving me? It's giving me discipline. It's getting my ass up out of bed. It's a metaphor for being an adult. Maybe I need to work more, whatever. It doesn't matter. There's no wrong answer. Whatever I answer and whatever my boyfriend answers, that's right for that person. That's what that person has to give back. In my case, I know uh, an alarm clock or discipline or time is a metaphor for Saturn, the planet. Saturn, the planet, is a metaphor for adulthood. And so I need to show up as an adult in my life, which is what I'm doing. So I'm utilizing my model to heal that. So the mistress helps you with your mystical marriage 
get what you need. So the mistress that shows up in your relationship is useful. It is not to be discarded. Just like Aphrodite needed Hephaestus and Aries. She needed both to achieve that love. We need to unify and integrate both. So this is part of the mistress is that part that's been discarded that we're trying, we don't know how else to do it, to integrate into our lives. The thing is that we've been sold this lie of monogamy or fill in the blank is not good. It's your value system that is shattered with the mistress. Okay? So you got to go back to the thread. That's why couples oftentimes don't know, they don't make it. I have something I call renegotiation. Everyone's heard of the seven-year itch. The seven-year itch is a Saturn cycle. It's the skinny cows within a couple. When that comes knocking, it's an opportunity to shatter that thread. It's an opportunity to shatter that snow globe, that mistress, and find a new one. But there's always going to be a mistress in your relationship because there's always a Hephaestus, part of you and your partner, that needs to go back to Olympus. Is this clear? Okay. Aries. Everybody has an Aries. When you were kicked out of Olympus, you said to yourself as a child, oh shit, I'm clubfoot. I'm ugly. I'm not a boy. I don't fill in the blank, whatever your story is. I must become that so that I am in good favor. This is what we call validation needs or ego. So what did I do? I worked like an animal. I made a lot of money. I acted like the male in my relationships to live out the story of my mother wanting a boy, right? I had to, I had the perfect story. You all have the perfect story if you can pick it apart, which is your homework. And you guys do have a life relationship conflict homework assignment. I don't know if you've seen it, but a lot of the questions, not in my language, but a lot of the questions are like your relationship, your conflicts, things like that. So you're to sort of hash out the, the story that you're living if you do that assignment well. <laughs> so we've assumed a personality, we've assumed an ego, Mars is that, we've assumed a creator, so something we're going to create in the world, whether it's children or a business or, or become CEO or whatever it is, whatever motivates you at the ego level. You're going to create conflict because every argument, every relationship needs that conflict. That's going to be your conflict style. There's going to be a power struggle, that power currency you guys wrote about. And where did you get this information? Take a big guess where you got your Aries or your fighting style or your conflict resolution style or your creator style or your ego or your validation. Where do you think you got this? The answer to everything in all of my classes. Your parents. <laughs> However, which parent did you get it from? If Hephaestus was thrown to the bottom of the ocean, and that's the overt, I mean the covert, what do you think is the Mars? Where do you think you got that from which parent it's on the board anyone the top like the like how you said the head and the neck the head Okay, the one you found was more in alignment with your values in my case it was my father the one you have the wrong alliance with is the one that you adopted as your conflict style. So I became a gritona and yeller just like my dad. I created in terms of money. My dad is like an entrepreneur and he's always, my dad can find money under a rock. My dad's a hustler. I became a hustler. So you, your Aries part of you, your conflict style, your validation needs, your ego, your creator, your warrior, your values, your thread mate, all of that comes 
from the parent that you have the wrong alliance with. So in essence, this is the parent you have the, the other alliance or the mistress. I just told you it's the mistress. My mother was the mistress, right? That's when I have to integrate. And my father is the one I adopted. Remember, Hera loved Aries. The one you loved, the one that you said, ooh, I like them, they have the power I want. There's no right or wrong. You like the little manipulative behind the scene power, code power, tab at it. That's your style, that's the area that you're accepting about your triangle. That's the one you have the wrong alliance with. I call it wrong alliance because we shouldn't be in alliance with our parents. Our parents should be in alliance with themselves and our, the child should be at the top getting the love, the needs met and stuff like that, the, we, the way it was sold to us. And every single person thinks they're screwed up because their parents didn't love them the way they should have. If you understand this, no one has gotten their needs met. And that's why I wrote that book. Nobody, some people really unhealthily, God forbid, their father raped them and others that were just abandoned or not just, but were abandoned or, or a father died and, and what could you do about that? And every single person has a wrong alliance. Mom and dad are not at the base of the triangle for anybody together healthily creating the child. If not, there would have only been Aries. They wouldn't have had two children. The myth would not have given us two virgins. So the one that you have the wrong alliance with is the way you're going to show up in the world openly. Does that mean you're going to be in your face, aggressive, assertive? If your mother is the one, if I would have adopted my mom's style, I would have been more passive. I would have been maybe more sensual. My mother's a very sensual, beautiful, elegant woman. I'm not. I'm a freaking animal. I mean, like my dad. And I say that. I'm a freaking animal. I'm now learning to be a little bit more feminine. March 8th will be anniversary of when I got my lumpectomy, my first surgery. The year after March 8th, which happens to be International Women's Day, not an accident, not an accident, I had a coming out party. I had a Venus party. The theme was Venus. I got Botticelli's Venus cake toppers. I put them on the little cupcakes. I gave my girls, it was only girls. We had a big labyrinth and I had everybody wear like little pagan Celtic headdresses and we danced like the women used to dance back in the day. I had this beautiful, elegant party where I put linen table I would never do that. I, I'm a paper plate and eat on the floor kind of person. Because my dad was like that. On the floor. My dad was like that. My dad is, is just a really bare bones. He, my dad is a hustler to work to give to us. Where my mother is the, my parents are Zeus and Hera, seriously. Seriously, minus the cheating. My mother's that elegant, beautiful, kind of naggy, but, you know, behind the scenes, making it all work kind of wife. Like, and I didn't want to be that. So I adopted my dad. You have adopted one or the other of your parents' styles. So if you understand, there's no criticism of which one, because I already told you they're both the same. I could have adopted my mother and gotten the same result, but I would have done it in a different way, and then I would have had to adopt my dad and been more assertive and speak up. So it doesn't matter which one you adopt. You're still going to have to integrate the other parent if you want to be whole. And if you really want to have a mystical marriage and really move your relationship forward. That's the point. If you know astrology, the sign that's on the cusp of the seventh house is this thread that your parents had. I have Gemini. That's like a manipulative, lie, cheat, steal, thievery. It's also a merchant. It's also a hustler energy. That represents a lot of my parents. And I didn't want to be that. So if I want to shatter that descendant, it's called in astrology, if I want to shatter that sign on the, on the seventh house cusp, I'm going to have to learn to do it differently. That's my only choice of having a healthy, good relationship and not repeating my parents. But we are all in a trajectory of repeating exactly what our parents showed us. Again, 
whether or not you ever lived a day with your parents. Your parents are your mind from the moment of conception. This does not mean that you ever met these people. Please do not take this figuratively. This is symbolic, metaphoric. So this is how it's going to show up in your life. And it's going to show up over and over and over again, whether you get divorced 15 times or break up with 20 different people as the same person because it's the theme that you need to integrate. So when I look at my relationships, I'm like, man, I played this out perfect. Every single one again and again and again. And I finally decided that I was going to integrate my mother, hence my Venus party. <laughs> and I'm still doing it three years, four years later. And I'm trying to integrate that bad bucket of my mother's, which isn't so bad because once I realize that it's just a perception. When I told you a few weeks ago about you have to pick a stance, that the, the Mars archetype is that warrior archetype. And, and I think Victor was here and I said, what happens if, if you pick a stance on the battlefield? You're going to get killed. Change it later. No problem. I have a, a step six in my first book. It's write a rule book. Change the rule later. I don't care. I'm changing the rules now. But I had to pick a, a, a stance. And I chose my father because in my mind, it was the lesser of two evils. It's not. It would have been the same thing. But we're, when we're little, when we haven't developed our, our, our personality and we're working in the subconscious, we don't know that. So we're looking at the power currency and saying, hmm, I like this one better. So identify what you chose from your parents. And that is the importance of going back and populating those buckets so that you could see what shadow you, you didn't want. I didn't want my mother's shadow that I now realize is exactly what I needed to get healthy from cancer. And when I realized that, I ain't going to get sick, at least from breast cancer on my left side anymore. Maybe it's my right, it's a whole other symbolic <laughs> disease. But I've integrated that. I've decided finally. And now I'm putting this into practice in my new relationship. So this is how we work with clients. You first figure out from each person what their Hephaestos is, what their mistress is, what their fighting style is, who has the power, you know, all the, these words. And then I ask, how'd you meet? That's your fantasy. The couple is always trying to get back to that. Why do you think when we start off in a relationship, oh my God, so much sex. Everybody's having sex. Sternberg says it's passion. Then we have intimacy and commitment in Sternberg's model when we did um, marriage and family. Because sex is one of many ways of which fantasy is satisfied. And so it's important to have a healthy sex life. People want to bring in toys or a third person or porn. I don't give a shit. Fantasize it up all you want. But you got to help couples, especially those that have lost that, bring in some fantasy into their relationship. And, and sex is obviously one of those factors of if we're talking about integration, obviously the unification of two bodies is one way to do that. So this couple that I mentioned earlier that he has the porn and the video game and she's got the baby and the ex and the ex-boyfriend, I said, bring that to the bedroom. Bring the porn to the bedroom. Let it play out in your marital bed. That's exactly where we should live out that mistress, where we should live out that Hephaestos. And a lot of people don't, or they have trouble. And of course, there's sex therapists, and of course, there's sex toys, and whatever you're into. Help your client integrate that part of them again. Because that's an important part. That's how did you meet? That's the fantasy. Now, not everyone's going to get off with sex. Other people will have fantasies in other ways, like gambling or drinking. Okay, then in the negotiation part of the relationship, that's the we circle of the I, I, and the we. What are the rules of the relationship? 
If fantasy is this guy playing video games, okay, how often are you going to play the video games? It's part of what he's bringing into the relationship. We have to permit it, so to speak, allow it. It's satisfying a fantasy, a Hephaestos aspect. Then we put it into the mix of what we're working with couples in terms of renegotiation and, and, and creating that we. We don't just say, oh, you can't have video games. It's absurd. There's room for everything in a relationship. Now, the relationship might shatter if you if you go back to that thread and the values have changed and that thread is no longer what's threading those people together, then that's a whole other story. And that might be the time that the, the, the renegotiation doesn't work, the thread has been lost, the shared values have been lost, and we're calling it a day. And the couple and the therapist will determine that together. But that's not where we where we jump to automatically. We assume that there's a lot of stuff that we can do. And the first fight, the first fight tells you everything. It tells you about the fighting style of the couple. Who's the overt? Who's the overt? Who's got what power currency? It tells us so much information. Couples may have different idea of what their first cup, their first fight is. I've had a few couples like that, but most of the time they'll agree on which is the first fight. And I'm not talking about who put the dish in the dishwasher type of silly thing. I'm talking about a big, this is the fight. That argument, that fissure of the egg, like I showed you before, that crack in the system, that crack in the snow globe is going to keep going back to that over and over and over again. It's one of the reasons why after fighting, people jump in the bed and have makeup sex. They're trying to integrate Hephaestus and Aries. They don't know how. They want to reach love. They want to get to Aphrodite, so they try to unite those two. It makes no sense. But, but, it's, but it does make sense. If you look at it from a psyche, this is the psyche. This is how we're acting in metaphor and symbol in our mind and our collective unconscious. It makes perfect sense. I'm trying to explain it and put it into understandable words that I have trouble with as, as I talk. I know I talk way too much to try to make the point. You know? And see, it, it makes perfect sense. If we come from a story, if we come from a myth that we all do, whether it's Greek mythology or the one of your parents, go back to the story. It tells you everything. So, of course, asking what the first fight <coughs> is going to tell you everything about what you need to know about that fighting style, who has the power or how they have the power, because everybody has power. It's just overt or covert. You saw that in your power currency paper. There's different power and how it's going to play out. <laughs> and ultimately what the couple's trying to do is unite the Hephaestus and the Aries so that that Zeus and Hera then can function. The thing is Zeus and Hera are so freaking flawed. So <laughs> that's a whole other story. But <laughs> if, we, if we can get to a place where the triangle is, is at least on the right foundation and, and you know, with the right, using the right mistress to inform the system and whatnot. So this is how I work with clients. Does this make sense? Does this help you? Does this inform your own relationship? Does it give you something to, to think about? Go back. You can go to my website, and you don't have to buy the book, but the website has the free workbook, so you can populate the buckets, which is nothing but just writing good and bad about mom and dad, but it gives the, syn the synopsis. Understanding that through your relationship, you're trying to heal your own Hephaestos, you can go to astrology and see where you have Neptune. That's your snow globe. And inevitably, that snow globe was shattered at some point. You know, I could see that in a chart with a client. But these are sort of the steps. And psychology explains this in other words. I just like using myth and metaphor and symbol and archetypes and such. But can you see how... This plays out from your parents to your own relationship. That makes sense, Keisha? Right? Doesn't it? I don't know. I think it's great. So this is my newest book. 
the truth is in the triangle. So, well, I spoke to the editor yesterday, and I'm meeting with the transcriber on Friday. So my goal is to have it to the editor by March, end of March, and at some point, hopefully later this year. But this is sort of, and it will have a little workbook where you can work with your couple, with yourself, with clients, stuff like that. So I'm trying to give you guys this information so that should you decide, not only for yourself, but if you decide to go into practice, you have. Again, there's many theories. A lot of people explain this. There's other books, but this is just the way that I, it makes sense to me. Okay? So this is conflict, and why we have a certain conflict style and a power style that you just wrote about in relationship. And this is why we come together. 